uh, we're going to start this lecture. So this is our second lecture from Stefan Zellner Rembold from Manchester, uh, who is going to continue to enlighten us about neutrinos. So uh, Stefan, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm just trying to share the slides. That's okay. You should see the title slide. Yeah, all good. Okay. So let me just continue today with what we, uh, where we finished off yesterday and uh, continue with our program of understanding uh, neutrino interactions and uh, physics at accelerators. Um, and where we left off uh, is shown on this slide, we defined the PMNS matrix, which describes the mixing uh, uh, of and oscillations of uh, uh, neutrinos uh, of three different types of flavor. Um, the way the, the matrix was decomposed, can you see the pointer um, moving? Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. we yeah. see it. Yeah, so the solar, uh, so the way it was decomposed in, in is that we have this part of the matrix, which is the mixing between the, the uh, first and second uh, mass eigenstates. Uh, and then this one, which is between the second and third, this is often called the solar part because uh, that's where, you know, the, 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 this is the part of the matrix which dominates for solar oscillation. This one is often called the atmospheric part of the matrix because it is uh, dominated by uh, atmospheric uh, oscillations. The one we haven't looked at in detail so much is the part in the middle. Um, now, this one is actually very interesting, even though it is expected to be small, because uh, we see here this phase delta, which is you know, the ultimate prize. We want to understand CP violation. But uh, in order to do that, we have to be able to measure this term, which uh, uh, requires that this factor in front of it is, is, is definitely not zero. From the measurements we have done so far in the solar and atmospheric uh, sector, uh, we see that these uh, angles are actually are quite large and the mixing between the, the states uh, uh, is, is, is quite uh, uh, significant. And you can see that on this, on this plot, which shows the mass eigenstates for the normal uh, hierarchy, or I sometimes use the word ordering. There is a little bit of a, uh, you know, people use both terms, ordering and, and hierarchy. Uh, it uh, is probably better to call it the ordering where one, two, and three uh, follow that sequence. And you see that here, the mixing is actually quite uh, democratic if you want, uh, uh, you know, the, the three flavors uh, contribute equally to, uh, uh, to new two, for example. This new, th uh, the, this term, however, is expected, as I said, to be small. And one way we can uh, uh, see it is uh, looking for uh, new E mixing driven by this uh, mixing and uh, 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 by this mass difference. So you see there's a very small component of new E in here. And uh, the, what, what is driving this is this mass difference. Uh, and therefore the, uh, you know, the oscillations driven by this uh, particular frequency. The way to do this, to look for new E mixing uh, is we should start with new E in some form. And as we have seen the best way uh, uh, to do this is from a, from a reactor uh, where the new E's are produced, um, or actually better, the anti-new E's in the, um, uh, in, the, in the reactor from beta decays. And one of the experiments that does this is the Dayabe reactor experiment in China. 
It's located close to uh, Hong Kong, just across the border into China, next to a big uh, uh, set of power plants, uh, which, which are here. And then there are um, different sets of uh, several detectors here nearby to the reactor and a little further away. And that you do because uh, in order to see the, the oscillation effect, you want to have a detector close by to the source and then further away uh, so that you can normalize the two things. This is shown in a more quantitative way here. This is the so-called survival probability. So the probability that the anti new E coming out of the reactor stays an anti new E um, as a function of the uh, distance for typical, anti, uh, for typical uh, energy, which is of the order three MeV when it comes out of the reactor. And uh, you see the total uh, mixing you expect with the with the oscillatory behavior uh, and uh, here at the short distances compared to you know no uh, so compared to uh, a survival probability of one you see this effect from of the red curve which is exactly uh, the uh, the mixing driven by this uh, angle theta one three the oscillation is driven by this angle theta one three uh, and this uh, uh, mass difference squared, this frequency of delta, uh, the larger one, the, the atmospheric one. So if you want to build an uh, uh, experiment, um, then what we can do, and then this is what Diabe has done, we look at the pretty close, so uh, at, uh, and this is actually shifted, it's, it's that's a PowerPoint effect. It should be more on the left. Uh, uh, for some reason, it shifted over. So we built a detector here, and then we built a detector here, uh, and we compare uh, the uh, anti new E flux. And uh, from that, you can then derive this angle uh, uh, theta one three. Um, again, this I've shown before, this is the uh, layout. Um, and um, uh, you have a hole which is uh, uh, about 300 meters from the reactor and then uh, one which is uh, like uh, two kilometers uh, away. Um, the, the way the detector works is that this is a scintillator detector, which is loaded with gadolinium. You often do that in order uh, to um, get uh, high neutron capture cross sections. This is uh, because the process we are looking for is inverse beta decay uh, as, it is, uh, as it is shown here. So the anti new E hits a proton and um, the, uh, pro uh, the, the, the reaction produces a neutron and a positron. The positron inhalates to a gamma and a, a pair and the neutron is captured, uh, emits photons, which are then all uh, uh, recorded in the uh, uh, in the detector in the scintillator detector with photomultiplier tubes, and there are eight of these detectors, which are all about twenty tons. Now, this is only one of those experiments. Uh, uh, there was quite a, uh, and I'll not talk about the others uh, in detail, but there are others: uh, Double Show, uh, uh, Daya Bay, and Reno, where the experiment that did this, uh, uh, it, and this was about ten years ago. Uh, so this is in France, uh, double shows, and, and Daya Bay uh, is in, in China, and Reno is in, in Korea. And they all did a similar measurement, uh, which is uh, comparing the rate of antineutrinos uh, uh, at their far and at their near hole. And you see that uh, uh, there is a, a depletion, and this depletion can be described by uh, theta one three, and you get actually very precise uh, uh, measurements uh, out of this. So the the surprise, uh, so it's uh, this this term here is of the order 0 0.1, and that was actually larger than what uh, people expected, and there was good news for potential CP violation measurements. Uh, because that uh, means that the term in front of the delta is actually not uh, that small. There's somebody cutting the grass outside, so I hope you don't hear that. Um, 
So um, this was good news uh, uh, and, and, and an exciting measurement. And you see that now uh, these, these experiments have progressed. This is a relatively recent measurement from uh, in Trina 2020. And on the right side, you see uh, uh, exactly what uh, we talked about before, um, the no oscillation uh, curve uh, is shown here. And then uh, the uh, measurement of the prediction uh, uh, for uh, a weighted baseline, which is like 500 meters and like uh, 1.6 kilometers, and you see how that depletion uh, works. An interesting aside for this is that it's actually not been so easy to understand the flux from a reactor. That's the disadvantage when you work with a reactor compared to an accelerator. A reactor, of course, is an extremely complex um, uh, machinery and uh, uh, the, the process of burning the fuel is, is very complicated. And uh, all these experiments observed uh, uh, unexpected bumps in their spectrum, which could actually be attributed to uh, nuclear uh, reactions in the reactor, which hadn't been uh, fully understood. So this is just an interesting side. So uh, we now know this term isn't, uh, isn't too small. We have measured this with uh, reactor anti new E disappearance. Actually, another way of looking at this term is to look at new E appearance in a new mu beam, uh, uh, because there should be a small component of this in, 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 a, in a new muon neutrino beam. Uh, again, this component is small. And, uh, if you, do, uh, if you do that, uh, you would be sensitive to uh, measure this uh, to theta one, three and, uh, uh, and the phase. And one of the challenges will be to disentangle, uh, uh, you know, if you measure this part of the matrix, um, the, the, the two effects. And that's what we'll talk about in the rest uh, of this lecture. Um, let me just remind you in very general terms, you all have uh, heard, I'm, I'm, assume about the CKM matrix, which describes uh, mixing in the, um, in the quark sector. And uh, it's of course a, a very similar matrix uh, uh, in, in principle. However, if we now look what we learned about the PMNS matrix and the size of these terms in this matrix and compare this to the CKM matrix, we see that the CKM matrix between the three quark flavors and the PMNS matrix uh, between the three neutrino flavors is uh, it's quite different. The CKM matrix is, is mainly diagonal and the off diagonal terms are really small. The neutrino matrix looks much more democratic uh, or, or uniform. Now, uh, this is an interesting observation. Uh, we don't uh, really understand, but it could be some underlying symmetry and it just shows you that neutrinos uh, um, uh, behave quite differently. Now, let me just quickly talk about the, uh, 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 a little bit motivate the CP violation measurement. We all know uh, about matter and antimatter. This goes back to now almost a hundred years and, and Paul Dirac uh, that predicted uh, for fermions that you would see uh, anti, uh, anti particle states. And uh, the first uh, anti fermion was discovered uh, the positron uh, by Anderson in 1932 and in cosmic uh, rays. And you see actually the entering positron and the exiting positron, you know this because there's a lead plate and uh, it's lost some energy. So, you know, the curvature from that. And this was positive proof that uh, these, these uh, anti-particles exist. Um, in order, we also know that uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, assuming there uh, was a symmetry at the beginning of the universe, we now live in a, a universe where there's fortunately some asymmetry between particle and antiparticles. Uh, however, it, um, and that's why we're here and can uh, discuss all this. Uh, however, the uh, uh, asymmetry, uh, that you need at the beginning uh, and at the Big Bang to, to uh, uh, explain this is actually relatively small. It's a small effect. Um, so 
this is important because uh, one of the conditions for this asymmetry to exist is, is the violation of CP symmetry, which uh, uh, I've just quickly uh, sketched on the right. What it means is, is C stands for charge, parity uh, uh, is, is uh, P stands for parity. And basically what it means, you turn around the charge of a particle and uh, in terms of its spin, uh, you make a, a left-handed particle, a, a, a right-handed particle. So that's how you get like, say from an electron to a positron. Now, um, the, the violation of, of this CP symmetry is important because it is one of the uh, Sakharov conditions. And just as, a, as an aside, uh, Sakharov is shown on this picture here, was born almost to the day uh, 100 years ago. So there are some celebrations actually happening uh, this week. And those three conditions are there's baryon number violation, there's CP violation, and there's a departure from thermal equilibrium. And, um, that's why we are so excited and interested in measuring this CP violation and uh, both uh, in, in, in the quark sector, but uh, where it's been observed, but also in the lepton sector, uh, which is what we are doing here. One of the exciting and interesting thing about it is that it could lend support to the theory of leptogenesis, which uh, is one of the ways to explain this, uh, bear, uh, this, this matter symmetry in the universe. So let me just say a few more words about this. We have this PMNS matrix, which is a three by three matrix. And um, while a two by two matrix, which we started out with is real, these matrices are in general imaginary due to this phase delta. And the, the, the interesting bit is that uh, a CP violation, which is uh, the difference between a process and its CP conjugate, is actually uh, only possible when the matrix is imaginary. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, because it, it creates a difference between a uh, process going in, in one direction uh, and going in the other direction. Um, and that requires that we have at least uh, three generations. Of course, the same is true for the CKM matrix, uh, where we have observed CP violation in, in, in quarks. Uh, but we also know that the CP violation in quarks, uh, in the quark sector, is too small to describe the matter dominance in the universe. So even though the effect is supposed to be small, the standard model CP violation is actually even, uh, even compared to that, is too small to explain the, uh, the effects uh, required by the Sakharov condition. Now, this is an important bit because it's sometimes a little bit uh, uh, confusing. Discovery of CP violation with neutrinos, which is what we are trying to do here, would lend support to the leptogenesis model. Um, but we also have to realize leptogenesis is uh, going to happen at uh, some large scale uh, related to the energy scales uh, after the Big Bang. Um, one of the ways this could happen is through the decays of a heavy right-handed neutrino, which would be predicted in models, which we call CISO models. Now, the CP violation, if we measured a, a non-zero CP violation in neutrino physics, um, you still need a model to extrapolate this to the scales uh, uh, required for uh, leptogenesis. I'll skip this slides because I'm, I'm going a little bit too slow, uh, uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's not really relevant. So let me, let me, Therefore, now go to accelerators, which is the place where we can make these measurements uh, uh, for, um, uh, you know, to, to, to look for CP violation. So the first thing we need is a, a, a new, an artificial neutrino source. Uh, mostly for what we have dealt with so far are ex, uh, uh, natural neutrino sources. This is, um, this is uh, uh, different. We want a beam. And we have to produce the beam. And the problem is, of course, that neutrinos are very hard to control. Uh, the way this is usually done, you have a proton beam. Uh, in this case, this is 120 GeV at Fermilab from the main injector. Uh, and then these protons hit a target, uh, a graphite target, for example, and um, produce secondary particles uh, uh, 
which uh, contain a lot of stuff, but uh, many of them are charged uh, pions. Uh, these charged pions decay into uh, muons and muon neutrinos, and um, the neutrinos from this decay we then use as a um, as a, a, a source of our our beam. Uh, now, one of the um, problems is to focus this neutrino beam. And one of the relevant and important uh, contributions uh, from CERN was to the invention of these magnetic horns by Sam von der Meer, uh, which are basically uh, tools to, to focus the, uh, the charge pan in such a way that you can get a neutrino beam uh, that uh, has, uh, is, 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 is in some way focused. As always, these, um, uh, these uh, accelerator uh, structures are complex. Uh, this is at Fermilab, and then of course uh, it reminds of what happens at CERN. There is uh, the former Tevatron on, on this side, uh, and then uh, what's called the main injector, which is used to accelerate the protons, which hit then uh, with 120 GV these targets and produce in the, uh, uh, two neutrino beams, which currently exist at uh, Fermilab. One is the new me beam, which goes to Zidane, and the other, for, uh, which is used for the short wave line program, is, is the booster neutrino beam. This is just a photograph of Fermilab. That's the Tevatron here, and this is the main injector, and the neutrinos go in that direction. Um, so one of the problems with making a neutrino beam is because is again you know it's not like a, a charged particle beam which is is easy to focus and uh, create a monochromatic uh, beam with a with a sink with a narrow energy spectrum. Um, just to understand this, what I've here uh, done here is this is the energy uh, uh, in when I look at the pion decay at rest now uh, of the neutrino that is produced when the pion decays in rest, that's about 30 MeV. And in order now to get the neutrino energies of the beam, we have to boost this into the lab system. We do this here with a gamma factor. And just to give you an idea for a pion of nine GeV at an angle of zero, you get a, a neutrino of about 3.8 GeV. Uh, however, um, this will depend, and you see that on this spectrum on the right, uh, this will depend uh, on the uh, angle which you uh, uh, of, of the neutrinos and um, you see the energy spectrum here um, for different uh, angles with respect to the uh, axis of 7 millirad, uh, 14 and 21 millirad. Sorry, my mouse keeps disappearing, I don't know why. Uh, and, and you see by going uh, uh, more and more off axis, we reduce the neutrino energy, but we also make it um, uh, the distribution narrow and narrow. The other thing we can do, we can choose uh, uh, forward or reverse uh, horn cor uh, current. Uh, so by choosing the current in the, uh, uh, in the horns, we can either produce a uh, 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 neutrino or anti-neutrino beam, depending on whether we select the negatively or positively charged uh, uh, pions. And you see this for NOVA, one of the uh, experiments at, at Fermilab. On the left is the neutrino mode. Uh, so you see it's mainly a neutrino with a little bit of anti-neutrino and vice versa on, on the right. Now, if you want to build a long baseline experiment, um, what we have to uh, 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 what we have to do um, is to pick the location of the far detector in the most optimal uh, 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 place, and we do this by looking here. So this is the uh, uh, probability again for an initial uh, muon neutrino beam. Uh, uh, to oscillate either into electrons or taus. We have seen this in a similar way before, uh, and we have L over E in the, the bottom. And so if you look for the first oscillation maximum, this is here, and this is uh, 
at an L over E of about 500 kilometers per GeV. And the second oscillation uh, maximum is about at 1,700 kilometers per GeV. So, you know, let's say we had a one GeV uh, uh, beam, we would choose our first uh, detector location at 500 kilometers, our second detector location around uh, 200, uh, 2,000 kilometers. Um, we are not always totally free in the choice of location, obviously. And I choose two length scales here, which are fundamental for neutrino physics. No, they are not really fundamental for neutrino physics. They are more fundamental for geography. Uh, one of them is 300 kilometers. And this is basically the, 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 the diameter of the island uh, uh, of, of Japan. And um, the bigger, scale of 1300 kilometers well that's what you can get in america when you go uh, it's a, it's a big country when you go around uh, chicago where the neutrino beam comes from uh, you will get on one side to the rockies and in the north somewhere to canada or minnesota now if we choose the first length scale um in order to get to 500 kilometers, we need, uh, uh, which was the first oscillation maximum, we need something like a, a beam energy of half a GeV. Um, in that case, we'll, because it is such a short distance and uh, we'll probably not see any uh, significant matter effects and we'll be sensitive to the first oscillation maximum. To do that, and if I just remind you how it worked with a, with a neutrino beam where we select the neutrino energy where we, by going off axis, what we do is we choose a, a narrow width neutrino beam by going off axis. If you go for the longer distance, we can actually pick two, uh, uh, the first and the second oscillation maximum if we have energies of 0.8 and 2.5 GeV. We'll expect matter effects because it's much longer. And in order to be sensitive to the first and second oscillation maximum, we can use a broadband neutrino beam. Uh, and to do that, we go on axis where we don't select a particular energy. Um, this has also impact, but this is more for tomorrow uh, on, on the reconstruction at lower energies. Uh, uh, you build more likely a water Cherenkov detector. For high energies, it makes more sense to build a liquid argon detector. So this is how the beams look like. This is the Japanese beam at the T2K beam. And uh, you see the it's located at 2.5. So their peak is roughly at the first oscillation maximum. On the right is the Dune uh, beam, uh, which uh, it's a function of energy, which is much broader. And uh, you see it, it, it ranges from something like half a GeV to well, almost uh, five or six. Again, so what, what does that mean? Well, on the left T2K, on the right uh, 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 Dune, and you see the uh, uh, original beam spectrum, the flux, and then the curves, the oscillatory curves show uh, the modulation of this, which you expect from, uh, uh, um, from the oscillations. And um, that's basically what we do as a measurement. So we measure at the near detector the flux, and then we measure the flux at the far detector, and we look at this oscillation. You see uh, you're basically sensitive to the first maximum here, and here actually to, to at least uh, uh, two. And then we compare these to this. These curves are just different values of the parameter set, and uh, that's what we then fit. Now, in reality, the situation is, of course, more complicated because um, um, uh, we don't actually measure event uh, rates, uh, uh, we, sorry, we don't actually measure the flux, uh, but we uh, measure uh, event rates. And uh, this means because we measure event rates, we become sensitive to other effects. We become sensitive to the cross sections, for example, if the, if the cross sections are not uh, uh, constant as a function of energy. We have to understand exactly how that works. We often work in a nuclear, with nuclear targets. We also have to understand that. Uh, we also um, 
have to understand the detector response. And, uh, you know, ideally you would have the same detector, the near detector and the far detector, but that's not quite uh, uh, so easy. This, this, this integral, uh, this ratio of integrals, which I've shown here, uh, given here is basically expressing this in a mathematical form. What we do is we measure the ratio at the far and near detector as a function of energy. And that's a convolution of the flux, the probabilities for the oscillation, uh, uh, the uh, cross-section, uh, some uh, detector effects which describe, uh, this matrix that describes the, uh, how your reconstructed energy uh, and your, uh, your true energy uh, relate. And you have to do that in the far detector and the near detector. So it's a complicated story. I've shown something similar yesterday. So this is about the problem with the cross sections because that's something we obviously have to understand. And uh, again, on the left is just the flux of neutrinos and on the right is the cross sections. But the typical, uh, uh, the, uh, the typical region where we talk about for these experiments is in the GEV range. Uh, so the um, uh, kind of processes we have to understand there are these, this is neutrino scattering on a nucleon. Uh, uh, so this can be elastic scattering. It can be quasi-elastic scattering, uh, which is shown here where you turn the neutron in a proton, but it can also produce a delta resonance. All of these of course are weak interactions, uh, which produce like a pion and a proton or, and, and that would be at the roughly the mass of the delta resonance. And then you can have, if you go to high energies, what's called deep elastic scattering, where you actually break up the, the proton and, um, and produce uh, hadrons in the, in the process. The, the processes that dominate uh, as a function of energy, as I've shown on the previous slide, they, they change. And this is a compilation of muon neutrino data on nucleons uh, taken from a publication by Sam Zeller and others. And, um, and a couple of things you see, this is for neutrinos and antineutrinos, the cross sections for antineutrinos are about a third of those for neutrinos. Um, at higher energy, the deep inelastic scattering dominates in the middle, this delta resonance bit, and then quasi-elastic at the, at the bottom. Now, this is um, the range uh, uh, of beam energies here, which we talked about. So this is the kind of processes uh, we, we have to understand. And the other thing you see from this plot, which compares the data with, uh, uh, you know, with models, is that actually the data isn't that great. Uh, there is quite a lot of uncertainty on this, and this is a major problem for these experiments. I'll just quickly flash one experiment which does these measurements of neutrino cross sections. That's the Minerva experiment. And they just use a muon neutrino beam and have an active tracker target with, um, with a scintillator uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in them. And they can measure extremely well these, these kind of cross section, which is a, is a very important bit uh, uh, for input for, for these kind of experiments. Uh, and I just flash these events because they show very nicely how they, they look like this is uh, uh, in, in their detector. So here you see, for example, a quasi-elastic scattering event. Uh, that's a neut neutrino uh, uh, pro producing uh, a proton and uh, uh, the muon is coming out, which again, you recognize uh, uh, by, the, um, by the length of the track. Uh, then this is one where there's an anti-muon and uh, the neutron is, is visible here by through something, you know, like uh, some light it produced and it takes a, a while before it, it, it does that. Uh, there is a deep inelastic scattering event, which you can basically recognize. Here's the muon and uh, a lot of other stuff that has been produced. And as I said, another complication here is that we have to understand nuclear effects, uh, which are um, which are messy. So uh, because most of these experiments work, like for example, Dune or with argon or the scintillator experiments, you have carbon-like targets. So you you have to understand that. 
it's it's a little bit different actually for for hyper k or super k of course because uh, here he worked with water but still even in water uh, it's it's mainly a, a nuclear target so you have um so you have a, a, a lot of effects which happen in the nucleus um so the um uh, what can happen is that things rescatter and uh, you know by these rescatterings for example what comes out of the nucleus doesn't look like um it doesn't look like uh, what you expect um I actually did my thesis a long time ago on measuring of nuclear effects in, in, in deep inelastic scattering with muons and turns out you know this is a, yeah it's it's a it's a it's a complicated business to understand uh, this kind of stuff so one thing you can do is you can measure with the same nucleus in in your near detector and in your far detector and um, this uh, would of course potentially mitigate some of these effects now these are the two operating low, long baseline experiments which do these kind of measurements, and I hope you understand now a little bit better why they are uh, uh, like this. So first here is super cameo, so uh, super cameo on the on the right. So the baseline is about three hundred kilometers from uh, the one side of Japan to the other side of Japan. All these experiments, the far detectors are deep underground, and this is to get rid of cosmic rays, which produce a, a major background. This is the T2K detector, sorry, the super K detector, the water with, it, uh, with the photomultipliers, we have had that before. And this is the near detector. And you see actually the near detector is a different technology from the far detector. Uh, so this is special about this experiment. The NOVA experiment has a baseline of 800 kilometers where the beam, uh, the new me beam from Fermilab goes to uh, uh, Minnesota. And uh, it, uh, it actually uses scintillators, uh, a liquid scintillator and has the same uh, technology for far and, and uh, near. This is again now in a little more detailed T2K. Uh, the near detector comprises these uh, calorimeters and also a beam monitor, which is called uh, Ingrid. Um, the, the super Kamiokande detector is, is a Cherenkov detector with 50,000 tons of water surrounded by about 11,000 PMTs, large PMTs, one kilo, kilometers of rock above it to get rid of the cosmics. And uh, just to give you the scale, it's about 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. And of course, this is always true with all of these neutrino detectors because the cross sections are so small, we have to build very, very large detectors, which is you know, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges of neutrino physics. The way these neutrinos are detected, and we had this before yesterday, where they came from the atmosphere, and now they come from a beam, is through Cherenkov uh, uh, light, which produces a cone, uh, which is characteristic of the, uh, of the speed of the particle, actually, and from which you can then derive uh, its properties. Um, this is... Um, this is uh, two Cherenkov rings as recorded by this array of photomultipliers um, the, uh, that surround the water. And uh, one is a muon, one is an electron, and uh, you might be able to guess uh, which one is which. Well, it's not only the diameter it's also of the ring, it's also the, um, let me say the fuzziness uh, in, 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 in the number of uh, photons and how they are spread out, uh, which uh, is uh, helping to identify on the right is therefore an electron and on the right and left is, is, is a muon ring. Of course, this is done in a more sophisticated way uh, using algorithms. Uh, so the near detector, as I said, is, is quite different from the far detector. It contains ECALs, scintillator, uh, um, and, uh, you know, different, different types of detectors. Uh, so this is, a, this is a challenge, but, you know, the, the main reason, of course, being that you cannot build a Cherenkov detector in the same form as a, uh, as a, as a near detector. For the NOVA experiment, uh, uh, this is shown again here. 
um, you have two functionally identical tracking calorimeter detectors. Um, the near detector is about 300 tons. The far detector is 14 kilotons and it's on the surface. So this is going to be a challenge. Normally they would be underground, but here it's on the surface. And again, it's placed off axis uh, to produce a narrow beam spectrum. Uh, and it currently has the longest uh, baseline of any experiment. So this is what you get when you build a detector on the surface. Uh, all of this is cosmic rays. The way this is built, these are towers of, of, uh, of this uh, scintillators read out by APDs and you just repeat this over and over again to build a very large uh, um, uh, volume. Um, so you have to get rid of this uh, cosmic uh, uh, stuff and uh, uh, this is done very well and it just shows you now a cleaned up interaction where the muon is here and then there's the hadronic recoil there, beautiful. Okay, now what's the bottom line? Of course, what we said, what we want to measure is uh, what happens to the muon neutrino beam in these uh, experiments. Uh, how many of the muon neutrinos we started out with actually disappeared and how many electron neutrinos appeared. So this is the uh, muon uh, neutrino spectrum uh, at the, the far detector uh, measured by NOVA for uh, the news and the anti news left and right. And um, you see the, the, the spectrum compared to uh, just one uh, and uh, quite a significant uh, event sample of about 200 and 100 events with, with a very, very small uh, background. This is from Neutrino 2020. This is the electron neutrino appearance. So what you see here, this is uh, uh, shown for different algorithms. So uh, um, the uh, uh, with, with different versions for the particle identification and uh, uh, both for again, neutrino and anti-neutrino beam. Now, the first thing you see that the number of events you see um, is, is much smaller than here for the muons, which is because electron muon uh, appearance uh, is, is, a, is a small effect. And uh, it's, it's also smaller in the anti-neutrino sample. Uh, still, the sample is large enough to give like uh, positive uh, evidence for, for that this actually happens. You will you'll have some backgrounds a little more in here uh, than for the uh, muon neutrinos, but you know this, the signal is, is is very clearly standing out. The T two K detector can do the same thing. Their energy distribution will look different, also because they reconstruct it in an entirely different way. Uh, here again, this is the same plots you, sh uh, you show in muon neutrinos and anti muon neutrinos for muon like rings. And here for electron-like rings, you see the same pattern going back and forth. Uh, uh, the electron uh, neutrino appearance is a very small effect and you get like, uh, whatever, 40 events or so, I guess, something like that. Just a reminder, how do we now extract the information from this? So this is the, the we start with a muon neutrino beam and then we look how many, we, we look for uh, the muons here and the electrons here. That defines whether we have a muon neutrino or electron neutrino. This is the disappearance measurement. This is the appearance measurement. And now we fit all this. And this is how we extract the information. And it's a little more complicated than just counting the events. So we use the data samples in the near and the far detector. We use everything together, the flux model, the, the beam monitor uh, data, hadron production data, cross-section models, detector models, the error correlation matrix, and then fit the oscillation parameters. And for some toy model, this is shown here where you just have the data and different uh, curves for different uh, mixing angles. Now, to give you a flavor, quote unquote, uh, that this is actually more complicated uh, than it, uh, you know, than than just the the more simpler equations I showed before. This is the probability for an electron neutrino appearance in the muon neutrino beam, and you see that it depends on all these factors, and it depends on this 
this is the uh, number, uh, this A is just proportional to the electron density in the matter it goes through. So this is this MSW effect. And then it depends on the various oscillation frequencies. And then, by the way, it also depends on delta, which is the number we want to extract. Um, the thing is that because all this depends simultaneously on delta and the mass ordering, and of course also on these other parameters, which, which in parts we have determined through other experiments, um, you want to extract the, uh, the data, uh, the, the information um, simultaneously. This will work actually particularly well if our baseline is long and we have a lot of MSW effect because then we can uh, disentangle the uh, uh, effect of the mass ordering and of the CP violation phase. So let me end with showing you the bottom line of what the experiments uh, uh, that are currently running have measured. And they, of course, as always, plot this in a slightly different way. I'll give you a combined uh, plot uh, on the next slide. On the left is NOVA, on the right is T2K. They give the significance or the delta chi-square as a function of the delta CP parameter, which uh, of course can be between zero and two pi. Um, and uh, uh, of course, if we had zero, then uh, uh, this would be kind of a trivial result. We wouldn't have any uh, uh, CP violation. Um, what you see on the on the right, this is the T2K resu result. Uh, uh, so the CP conservation, so zero pi would be, uh, is, is excluded at the 90% confidence level by them. But of course that is still a relatively, you know, I wouldn't say weak, but it's, it, it still, uh, you know, allows of course for, for almost anything to be possible. And there's a slight preference for normal ordering. On the left, you see the similar plot, just note the, the different axis here. Um, there's more sensitivity because of the longer baseline to the combination of CP phase and then mass ordering. Uh, but they, um, they somehow, they are difficult to disentangle. The normal ordering is slightly preferred. However, it's a one sigma effect and they exclude uh, inverted ordering uh, uh, at three sigma at this maximal delta and disfavor normal ordering at two sigma at delta of three pi over half. Um, if you put this all together, if this was slightly confusing, yeah, this is because it is uh, all not very statistically significant yet. It's very exciting and interesting, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not at the five sigma level. And what the plot here shows as a function of this other mixing angle, which I haven't really talked about, um, uh, the, uh, the delta CP uh, for, um, uh, so this is NOVA and this is T2K now shown on the same plot with the, with the contours. And what you see here is that, well, the current data are pretty, inconclusive. Uh, we expect some improvements with further running for these two experiments, but what you really need to disentangle this and to, to have an ambiguous uh, discovery of CP violation uh, in the neutrino sector, you'll need the next generation of experiments that can do this uh, at the five sigma level. And that's the thing I'll be talking about tomorrow. All right, thanks, Stefan. And uh, uh, for yeah, very clear lecture. And I think uh, we can have some questions. I saw already one question. I think on the on the chat. I don't know if you see that. Uh, yeah, I see that. So basically, this is just a case. So the question is, why is the beam narrow for the off-axis case? But this is just a kinematic effect, yeah? Uh, this is just um, from the, um, so you have to, uh, uh, this is just the kinematic effect from uh, boosting this uh, uh, decay uh, in the rest frame into the uh, uh, lab system. And uh, you therefore, basically you select from this, 
well, one way of looking at it is you see the on axis, you still, you, by, by going off axis, you select slices of this, uh, but of course the, the, the slices as you go on the, uh, to the left of this, of this black curve will, will become narrower and narrower, but it's basically just the kinematic effect from this, um, uh, from this boost. Right. Uh, Soren has a question. Uh, sir, how do we calculate the gamma factor and the beta factor here in the formula? Oh, this is just, I mean, you just calculate, uh, uh, this is from the energy and the mass of the pion. This is just, the 9 GV is just a particular number, which I picked because I picked one, but you know, you ba you just calculate it from the, um, uh, so the problem of course, is that the protons come in with whatever, 120 GV, let's say in, in, in this case, but uh, the pions that are being produced are not produced all collinearly and they are not produced all with the same energy. So in order to really calculate the beam spectrum, you have to actually take the true distribution of pions, which is produced in this process. And that's difficult. And that's, by the way, also one of the reasons why it's, you can't just calculate analytically that, uh, you know, you have to understand very well um, uh, how all these things, um, how all these things works, because it's not like a, a, a nine GV beam. It's just one number, which I picked from that distribution. Okay, so the, the gamma factor is the normal relativistic factor. So it's, if you want to have a first estimate, it's just the energy divided by the mass, and then you have this 64. Um, balance. Stefan, thanks a lot for this nice presentation. I had a question about um, uh, cross-section, neut uh, neutrino cross-sections. I mm -hmm. understand the next generation of the Dune experiment is going mm -hmm. to have a, the far detector a liquid argon target mm -hmm. and um, we have a lot of understanding well more, more or less about the carbon and water so i was just wondering given the, the target sensitivities that one wants to reach for delta cp and so on what is the current uh, limitation in the understanding of neutrino cross-sections on the argon target um so in a way you can see it already now from that plot, and of course this is just this is just the uh, the total cross section. Uh, uh, the next the next problem is the uh, uh, is the uh, the whole interaction the differential cross sections. Yeah, I mean you, you don't only have to understand the total cross sections, but you also have to make measurements of the differential cross sections. One of the um, one of the things which we can do to improve this understanding, which isn't very good yet, uh, is to do these measurements at the Fermilab short baseline program, uh, which would be Microboon, which is currently running, or SBND, which will be running in 22, or the third experiment is Icarus, which is also running. I think for the cross section, it's really SBND and Microboon because they are the close experiments. They'll get enormous rates. Uh, the other thing you can do in Dune itself, and I'll mention this tomorrow, is uh, there will be a liquid argon TPC, a pixel detector, and also a gas argon TPC. Well, at least that's the plan. And the gas argon TPC uh, is actually great to understand the interaction modeling because, um, because when you have the liquid, uh, you absorb a lot of things. And in a gas argon TPC, you can actually measure the, the full interaction uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a very nice way. Yeah? Thanks. All right. Any further questions? While, while you think I have actually two more de um, details, which as always, can you go close by to slide 87? just for the visual impression. So you have this, this, this showers and this detector in the, in the back. Is this the actual size of, of what, uh, what, what you would see in the detector geometrically to give that impression or? To be honest, I have just overlaid this without thinking about that bit. Oh, okay. Uh, 
I think it's probably not that far off because if mm. you look at the at the density the pixel, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. TMTs, it is uh, roughly comparable. Yeah. Um, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say. Yeah, that's that's what made me thinking, but but in fact, I never had told about it. So, uh, mm -hmm. all right, okay. And and for slide seventy nine, this is this is a micro detail, but uh, you showed the Minerva experiment, mm -hmm. uh, and you said something like uh, coming soon on this liquid helium targets. Is is that still actually happening, or is that uh, just a slide which was? before they, they actually took that. I uh, uh, I had that slide for a couple of years, probably. Up yeah, because I thought I thought that's already done, but, I, yeah, yeah. but but okay, good, fine. Okay. Any other questions for today from anybody? I don't see anybody, uh, anything now going once, twice. Okay, so thanks Stefan. And uh, we looking forward to another great lecture tomorrow, your third lecture on uh, neutrino physics here. Thank you. And, and thanks everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, bye.